Hi, guys, and welcome back to the IBS Freedom Podcast. I am joined by none other than Amy Hollenkamp, to the max, RD, comma, beautiful lady? Yes, I dare say. (laughs) I'm excited to run out of stuff to say, but I think it fits. Comma, beautiful lady. Wow, I am feeling built up right now. You should. You're special. So how do you do, Amy? I am doing well. I'm doing well. I I went to the gym today, so that's Ooh. why my hair is all wet. If you're watching this video wise, nice. I'm getting well, swole, you know. That's and, right. You know, lean, mean, fodmap eating machine. You right, are. right. Getting very swole, so I that's always had fun. A, a brief moment about a couple of weeks ago where I like I lifted weights a couple times at home. I was like, yeah, this is good. I'll be I'll be ripped in no time. <laughs> And then I just kind of fell off the wagon. I've been doing, I'm still doing my fitness marshal a couple days a week. Um, Nice. I'm not, I'm not doing the fitness marshal. That sounded really bad. I'm doing fitness marshal videos as like a routine. Yeah. Um, But yeah, I haven't, I haven't been feeling it for the weightlifting. So maybe you'll inspire me by saying so. Cause I always enjoy it when I do that. Yeah. I, I know what you're saying for me. Like I can't do it more than like, I think tops three days a week. I can do it twice a week and then I just do other stuff some of the other days, like more laid back stuff. Um, But I also went during COVID times when we're in pandemic and the gyms were all closed. My husband built a gym in our basement. Um, But like, I found it boring. (laughs) Like it was much harder to motivate me to do Mm -hmm. weights yeah. When I was just doing it by myself and we had a TV down there. So there's like at least something to like keep me in yeah. like, but now that the, but I'm still. going back to my gym, it's like so nice because it's people that I hang out with. I mean, the same people are there all the time and it's just a fun environment. So oh, good. Good. Yeah. Well, I hope, I hope that you someday can have an 89 year old gym boyfriend like I did, which I believe I divulged in a previous episode. So if you guys are confused what I'm referencing, go listen to our other episodes. Well, well I, Matt. funny you say that, um, my, the, the head, the guy who runs all the classes, his 84 year old grandma's coming in this week. Oh. Um, and I was like, what are you going to have her do? And he like ran me through his whole thing. He's like, well, we're just going to work on like sitting up and get it standing, like yeah. sitting up and sitting back down again. And then like, he showed me some other stuff that he was going to plan. And I was like, I really want to be in that class. Cause just watching like an 84 year old doing yeah. exercise stuff is going to make me happy. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, there's gotta be some element of like, all right, if she can do it, I can do it. Come on. Hop right. To right. Right. Love it. Love it. Well, believe it or not, guys, we did not record this podcast so that you could learn about the 84 year old lady going to Amy's gym. Although I adore it. We are going to talk all about polyphenols. So uh, I will open it up to the dietitian in the room first and foremost, as I usually do. I put you on the spot, Amy. Yes, always. Let's open the floor. Like, what is a polyphenol? Why should I care? Do I have to eat them? Do French fries have polyphenols? Tell. Tell. (laughs) Well, first off, French fries, I don't think French fries have polyphenols. They're not super high levels, unfortunately. Darn. But um, maybe like a little. Yeah, maybe like a smidge. Okay, a smidge. That's the technical term. There is a smidge yeah. of polyphenols in French fries. But polyphenols are compounds within, I would say most plant foods have some mm-hmm. level of polyphenols. Some are going to have more than others. Um, but I do think the interesting thing about polyphenols when you sort of do some digging into them is that like for a long time, people didn't understand, like scientists didn't understand how they were reducing inflammation. Because these these mm-hmm. compounds, these polyphenols reduce inflammation. Mm-hmm. Um, and ev- everyone has known for a while blueberries, oh, oh, they yeah. reduce inflammation. But like for yeah. a while, scientists didn't really understand all the ins and outs of why. They knew it was because of these polyphenol compounds, mm-hmm. or at least partially from these polyphenol compounds. Um, but we don't absorb them. Mm. So, yeah, so it's not like it's getting into the bloodstream right. and exerting an effect. So that's why the scientists were a little bit more confused. It's like, well, how are these compounds, these polyphenols, lowering inflammation, like systemically, mm-hmm. uh, 
when they're not being absorbed into the body and digested um, and absorbed. So what they found more like I would say more recently, I don't I can't give exact dates, but I'd say probably in the past 10 years Hmm. is that these polyphenols raise like they modulate the microbiome. They're prebiotics. So they raise levels of good microbes. And through that, that's what really drives down the inflammation. Um, so in a weird way, it's like it's your microbes and all the compounds that they produce that are going to be helpful for lowering the inflammation. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I always like that story because it's like I could just see people like sci- I always imagine scientists scratching their heads like, oh, what's what's going on here? There's no absorption. Yeah. Um, Bob, what do you think about this? Right. I don't know, Rick. Like, right. We know these blueberries, they're doing their thing. They're lowering inflammation, but we don't know why. And then yeah. um, I just think it's really cool that it's potentially modulated mostly by the microbiome Yeah, uh, that these levels of inflammation are going down yeah. with polyphenols. Yeah. And of course, it, it should come as no surprise to people tuning into this podcast, unless this is your very first episode ever. But, you know, the gut microbiome plays a huge role in whether or not your immune system is happy and balanced Mm -hmm. or totally pissed off and inflamed. And it plays a big role in whether or not you can absorb your nutrients and digest your freaking food. And there's there's so many implications for how the microbiome affects the rest of the body, including systemic inflammatory potential. So it would it makes sense that manipulating the microbiome for the better and feeding the good bacteria predominantly is going to have a systemic anti-inflammatory effect, but it's not the same as like taking an aspirin or, right. you know, consuming something that's going to be absorbed and then put into the bloodstream. It's really just lo- locally affecting the microbiome. And then that's what we, we wanted to do anyhow. Right. So, okay. Well, so polyphenols are rad and we can't get a tremendous amount from French fries, supposedly, <laughs> per my mean friend here. Um, Sorry. I will share. You should be. Um, I will share. There's an article that I, I think oh, has been cited a fair amount of times now, but they they went through, I think it was a 2010 article, mm-hmm. I want to say, but they went through and they looked at foods that have the most polyphenol content overall, and they broke it down per 100 milligram so, or no, 100 gram serving. Mm-hmm. And then they broke it down into like, what is a reasonable portion size? Because <laughs> right, of course, when right. you look at 100 grams, it was like cloves, oregano, right. thyme, rosemary. It was only spices at the top of the list. But nobody in their right mind is going to eat 100 grams of cloves every day. That would just You don't know my life. True, true. I'm not going <laughs> to judge if you do. I'm just saying. You don't Most know my life. That's what I do every day. I, that's you know, how I get my polyphenols. I did not know that. Well, well there you have now, it. Now, no, all right, episode's done. We don't, okay. you know, we don't need to talk anymore about yep. it. Just eat 100 grams of cloves. Yeah. But just just in case people don't want to do that, I'll just continue <laughs> right now. So indulge me, if you will. So of course assuming that you don't want to do that, they also broke it down based on what could be a reasonable serving size for anybody but Amy. And then we start to see the list make more sense. We're like, blueberries and blackberries, Mm -hmm. you know, currants, elderberries, all of the berries really top the list. And then we see it followed by things like coffee and green tea, artichokes, even. And I I conveniently have a prop this time, but Mm. olives, which I keep handy, um, cocoa powder, some other fruits in particular. I noticed when I looked at this list that the fruits Mm. really made a strong appearance. Right. And spices and herbs made a strong appearance vegetables are less compelling which was interesting yeah Uh, i i've i've seen that list i've seen that list too and i've had the exact same thought of like you know there's so much hate or there's like a group of people that hate on fruits uh i don't know if you've seen them like oh there's too much sugar in fruits maybe it's sort of more of the low carb mentality Mm -hmm. but i do think there was a while there where I was seeing functional medicine being like, okay, you can eat as many vegetables as you want, yeah. but you know, those fruits you should be a little bit careful with. Um, and I, I think again, this is a even more of a, a, a more evidence to 
eat the fruit and eat a variety of different fruits um, to get some polyphenols because they're going to yeah. do that for you probably more so than, than vegetables. Yeah. And I will pause too and just kind of laugh at this conversation a little bit, by the way, because <laughs> what we're doing right now is it's a worthwhile conversation, but also it is inherently a little bit silly. And in the words of Michael Pollan, uh, how did he phrase it? A food is worth more than the sum of its parts. So right. like if we looked at a carrot and we're like, okay, it has this much beta carotene, this much protein, this much fiber, this much whatever, this much polyphenol, and then we could like judge the carrot. But there's probably, uh, what I wonder, like looking at how underrepresented the vegetable group is from right. this list, I kind of wonder if there are some polyphenols that we have yet to discover Yeah, that are more predominant vegetables? I mean, I don't know. That's totally my theory, but it makes you wonder because again, like I think there's something about a whole food or a plant food right. that is intrinsically health promoting beyond what our current scientific understanding is. So I don't want people to get too lost in this, this conversation of like, oh, okay. I, if I eat fruit, I can only eat black choke berries, blueberries, and you know, um, plums. Like, that's all I can right, eat. Like, no, right. you could probably eat, like, bananas and spinach and other foods that aren't on this magical list. Actually, spinach is on the list. That was a bad idea. Um, cauliflower. Like, you could eat other foods. It's just, it, sometimes it's helpful to have these, like, kind of Western medical, very scientific constructs to give you mm -hmm. some support and some structure at different phases of the healing journey. But ultimately, when you recover from IBS, when you cure your SIBO, when you cure, you know, whatever it is that's ailing you and you become like a normal functional human again, not that you're not functional, that was so rude, sorry. Um, but, you know, when you like overcome whatever you're trying to overcome right now, whether it be IBS, SIBO or whatever, the goal is to just eat like a normal human and eat right. fruits, vegetables, whole foods, healthy fats, and like not overthink it to death. Right. So I just, I want to like pause there for that second. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's very accurate. And I, I think too, like, even if vegetables are lower in polyphenols, let's say that's, a, that's turns out to be true, but we probably, again, there, we don't know everything that's in every food. Yeah. Contrary to maybe like popular belief that we would know everything, but we just don't. And, um, but there's still other valuable things in vegetables, like there's so yeah. many other valuable compounds that might not be Absolutely. polyphenols, but like what you're saying, vitamin, beta carotene, uh, vitamin C, like all these other nutrients that are in fruits, yeah. like you're much better off getting a wide variety of different, mm -hmm. uh, different plant foods because you're going to get a, a wide variety of different nutrients then. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think we could even take this conversation to like the realm of what I personally would consider absurd. So let's take the two <laughs> most opposite ends of the polyphenol spectrum. Are you ready for this, Amy? Are you ready? Let's go yep. on a ride. Are we going um, like serving size wise or gram? No, 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 no. Imagine if you will, two humans. Okay. One is eating the carnivore diet. Not a polyphenol in sight. Yes, yes, yes. Not a polyphenol has graced this microbiome in potentially months or years. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have the fruititarians. Yes, that is a thing. People yes, who only yes. ever eat fruit. Steve like, Jobs was a fruititarian. Really? Yeah. That, and then Ashton Kutcher, who played him in a movie, sorry, this uh -huh. is a side note, got okay. sick from trying to be fruititarian. Oh. Like had to go to the hospital. I don't, I don't, I remember, it could, huh. this could be totally wrong, but I know something happened with Ashton Kutcher because he huh. was trying to be fruititarian to, like, prepare for the role. Huh. Well, you got to give the guy credit for really taking the role seriously. Like, that's a whole right. other level. Right. Um, huh. I did not know the Ashton Kutcher thing. Fun, that's your fun fact of the day, folks. Yeah, fun fact of the day. Yes. Um, but, you know, can you imagine, on the one hand, again, with the, the person who's eating carnivore, it's like the ultra low fiber diet in a way. Right, right. Right. So if you have SIBO, there is a likelihood that you would feel better transiently while doing the carnivore diet mm -hmm. because you are starving the SIBO, quote unquote, effectively enough that you're going to reduce symptoms. But is that going to promote optimal health long term? And is that healthy for you to live your life that way 
And then basically like never go to a restaurant again, never go out to a birthday or a wedding or eat normal food, quote unquote, again. I don't, I don't know. It's your, your life. But we could potentially have people walking around out there who have literally zero polyphenols in their diet. And then the opposite of the spectrum, like the fruitarians to pick on them, they right. theoretically should have a crap load, pun intended, of polyphenols in their gut. But <laughs> there are going to be potentially a lot of nutrient deficiencies. Yes. I mean, you don't get a lot of protein that way. You don't get a lot of vitamin B12. You're not going to get a lot of zinc or iodine. Like there's so or many iron. nutrients that you're not going to yeah. get iron on a fruitarian diet. Now mm -hmm. I will pause. So I love like whenever we make these kind of statements of like, you're not going to get enough protein being a fruitarian. Inevitably, I'm going to cut you people off. Please don't email us the meme that has a picture of a gorilla eating a blade of grass or whatever and saying, where does the gorilla get its protein? He's still swole. Like you've seen those, right? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. It Human bodies and human metabolism and human metabolic and physiologic needs are different from any other animal. So you're completely, you're comparing a mouse to a potato. If you send a meme and say like, yeah. oh, here's a picture of a cow eating grass. Where does the cow get its protein? Nah, don't even. I will delete that email. <laughs> Just, I'm not here for it. But you know, it's like you've got you have this big spectrum. The best probably lies somewhere in between. Yet again, right? Where you're not going to be deficient in protein and iron and B12 and zinc and God knows what, and you're also not going to starve your microbiome of the things that it likes. Like just variety. <laughs> variety is yeah your saving grace. And the polyphenol thing is, again, you could theoretically take it to the extreme and only eat berries, but then that's going to do other weird stuff to you. You could take it to the extreme and not eat a polyphenol in your life, but that's going to take it to a different extreme. You know, right. Give it a little bit of thought, mull on it a little bit, and we'll talk about the potential of what these compounds can do. Um, so if you're not currently eating berries or if you're not currently, you know, aware of this and the potential usefulness, then hopefully we can help you in that. Uh, but right. don't take it to either of the extremes and run away with it. I don't think that's necessary. Um, right. Variety which, variety on the plate um, is going to ensure optimal nutrient status, both from a micro, yeah. a micro, macro, and phytonutrient level. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Um, and keep in mind, too, there's different polyphenols in different fruits and vegetables. So, mm -hmm. again, theoretically... If you just ate apples, nothing else, you just had like five apples a day and meat and potato, whatever else. But if that was your only source of polyphenols, that's probably going to be less beneficial than if you ate some berries and an apple and some grapefruit juice and some flax seeds and some cocoa powder and some chocolate, you know, whatever right. it might be. So the variety ensures that you get this nice, broad, protective, anti-inflammatory effect instead of just putting all your eggs in one basket, food pun not intended actually, and then thinking that like the seven bananas a day or whatever is gonna do something miraculous for you. That's not usually how it works. Right, right. Yeah. Totally, um, totally agree. Yeah, but you want to, uh, let's take a moment to nerd out with our listeners. Um, we had each pulled up a couple of articles that we wanted to share little nuggets from. So you want to open with that and share a couple of the ones that you had brought to my attention because I wasn't familiar with these particular studies. Yeah, so it's interesting. I did a a when I was in diet my dietetics internship, to become a dietitian you have to do like 1200 hours under a, a dietitian mm -hmm. and as part of that I had to do something called a lunch and learn, which oh. was just kind of a a pretty thorough like evidence-based discussion. Um, I did my lunch and learn, let, let me see the title. <laughs> my lunch and learn title was metabolic endotoxemia and how dietitians can help, which I think is probably the nerdiest thing. I don't think the hospital dietitians were ready for this, but <laughs> they were uh, I assure you. We made it happen, uh, or at least I made it happen, not we. There you go. Um, but uh, let me pull... Sorry, I just had the slide up, but I just had to see what my title was called. I'm glad. Essentially, like, 
the thing that was crazy when I started looking at polyphenols and endotoxemia, metabolic endotoxemia is essentially like if you have intestinal permeability and you have a lot of endotoxins in your gut that are kind of seeping into the bloodstream and that's causing a lot of inflammation, Mm -hmm. that inflammation can then cause metabolic dysfunction like insulin resistance, Mm -hmm. diabetes, those types of chronic diseases. Um, So just an overview on that. But a lot of poly, there's a, or at least these two that were pretty well done, um, were both polyphenol studies on more metabolic issues. So one of them looked at um, grape polyphenols, so polyphenols Mm -hmm. and grapes. And what they found um, was that, you know, it was really protective for metabolic issues. Um, And they found that, you know, if you give grape polyphenols in isolation, that it raises acromantia bacteria. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that's really what's going to drive down and, and create a lot of these anti-inflammatory effects. Mm-hmm. Um, and they said that the grape polyphenols uh, seem to have several effects, including uh, it changed a lot of inflammatory cytokines. Um, it seemed to help reduce LPS. So it seemed to help with endotoxemia. So like strengthen the gut barrier. Um, and there's a lot of anti-inflammatory, uh, markers that increased with these great polyphenols. Um, so essentially again, like what they're saying is really that it's strengthening the gut barrier Mm -hmm. and that's causing this, this systemic reduction in inflammation. And then that affects metabolic function positively. So it helps with insulin function. Insulin, it makes you more insulin sensitive, those types yeah. of things. Um, then there was another study along the same lines with cranberry extract. So a slightly mm-hmm. different one. But they basically found that, you know, doing this cranberry extract actually counteracts like high fat feeding so like Mm -hmm. if you're eating a lot more fat rich foods kind of like you know i don't want to demonize fat but like a a less fiber high fat kind of like a standard american diet diet in a way um they were feeding i don't remember if it was mice or if it was actually i don't think it was an actual human study for that one Mm -hmm. um but they fed the subjects in this study, a high fat diet, like Mm -hmm. more low fiber diet to try to induce metabolic dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And they found that the polyphenols in the cranberry extract counteracted the effects. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have the metabolic endotoxemia and things sort of creating dysfunction and inflammation when the cranberry extract was present, Mm -hmm. which is kind of wild to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. And we were joking a little bit before we got on today's uh, podcast and we were joking about, we don't want people to think, yay, I could go to McDonald's <laughs> and I'll just take a cranberry supplement. Ha ha. Right. Science for the win. Like that's right, probably right. not the best way to go about it. Right. Like hopefully we can all admit that. But what what's nice is that we see these really extreme situations of, again, like theoretically eating a McDonald's meal, eating something with a lot of refined, easily absorbable carbohydrates and sugar and fat, particularly saturated fat, which normally should be very detrimental to the system, the microbiome, the gut health, and induce what we would later label as metabolic syndrome, like obesity, type one diet or type two diabetes, prediabetes, um, hypertension potentially. So it's neat to kind of take this like extreme look at like, whether or not a polyphenol can protect against that kind of downstream effect in order to determine where it's exerting its effectiveness. It's kind of neat to see that, but yeah, please don't like eat garbage and <laughs> take a cranberry supplement and think that you're good. Right. Right. I I love that. That study's funny. Cause it's like, you know, what, how can we still get benefit without making much change? Yeah. You know, in that study, it's, it's very like, 
to me seems very pharma ish, but I, I know yeah. it's not, it's probably not, but like, you know, let's do like one, like, let's take a pill, like let's take a cranberry pill. Yeah. Um, you're cured. Yeah. Yes. You're good to go. Well, um, Oh, sorry. I, I was just going to say it does make you think this though. I, we, we have preached it before. We will continue to preach this until the cows come home. We are both in professions where the subtractions are oftentimes mm-hmm. overemphasized, particularly yes. in my field in functional medicine. And, you know, people telling you gluten is evil, never eat it again. Dairy is evil, never eat it again. Soy and corn and grains in general and lectins and oh my God, anti-nutrients and saturated fat. Like you get to a point where you think you can never eat anything again. You right. can just have organic ice cubes for your meals. But we see so many patients who have come from a world that has made them over restrict their diet. They're doing low FODMAP plus low histamine plus AIP, or they're doing low FODMAP plus SCD plus the elemental diet. Like, and it's nice to see this kind of a study where they actually didn't subtract anything. They just added something else. Right. Right. So right. For the people who are feeling stuck on low FODMAP, or a SIBO diet, or a restricted diet, or AIP, maybe you don't need to stress about it quite, quite so much. And you can just focus on adding one or two good things per week. And you can get some healing and you can get some mileage out of the additions. And then gradually over time, you can add in those foods that currently are off limits to you. I used air quotes, by the way, for those of you listening. Right. And I do think sometimes with polyphenols, you can usually find something, even if you're, even if you're kind of coming from a low FODMAP place and you're like, I don't really know what to add in. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's a little bit easier to increase polyphenols than it is to maybe like increase other areas. Um, yeah. So it's just kind of another avenue that you could utilize, like what you're saying, adding things in, thinking about it in that way. What might give you the most bang for your buck, as my dad likes mm-hmm. to say. Yeah. For, for an addition, polyphenols could certainly be something that you could utilize uh, to add variety back in uh, yeah. without necessarily like going just a lot harder on the FODMAP side of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think that it's a very worthwhile conversation for our listeners in particular, since again, so many people are on these really restricted diets and they're feeling quite stuck. Right. Uh, and I would say too, again, not only do you get to add in a food and focus on the additions, which can be a freaking sigh of relief if you've potentially been restricting your diet for months or years, but also you get the added bonus of facilitating the healing process in the process. So like Mm -hmm. if you do have leaky gut and low acromancia levels and endotoxemia, then you can literally start healing that through these additions. Or I'll share just the two articles I had popped up. And one of them the name says it all. And the other one, I'll just read like a short little blurb from the abstract. So one of them, uh, the title was polyphenol extracts interfere with bacterial lipopolysaccharide in vitro and decrease mm-hmm. postprandial endotoxemia in human volunteers. So postprandial means after the meal. So mm-hmm. it's basically the same thing you were just talking about, the metabolic endotoxemia, the increase in endotoxin absorption after a meal which is induced by leaky gut. And very often it's associated with really high fat meals, Mm -hmm. uh, particularly saturated fat. Um, And side note, yes, that does include coconut. So if you drench your food in coconut, that is a saturated fat and it will promote that a bit too. Um, But this was interesting. They said this particular study actually did go as far as to evaluate people for SIBO, which I gave them credit for. Uh, But they said, let's see. Uh, Compared with placebo, the grape extract did not affect postprandia triglyceridemia, but did decrease plasma LPS without affecting IL-6 associated inflammatory response. SIBO did not affect these variables. So interestingly, even the people with SIBO um, had some benefit and the the occurrence of SIBO didn't necessarily negate Mm. or promote this any more than baseline. But the people who had the great polyphenol extract did see a reduction in lipopolysaccharide levels. Now, I don't remember what the duration was of this particular part of the study, 
Um, I wouldn't expect to see a decrease in interleukin-6 for potentially weeks. Like, not something really measurable. So I don't know how right. they did this. But LPS, I mean, you could potentially measure that from day to day and see big changes, depending. So I, yeah. I'm not sure if I'm really taking the IL-6 thing with a grain of salt or not. But I thought it was really encouraging that compared to the placebo, the grape extract did see a decrease in plasma LPS levels, that endotoxin level in the human um, study people participants. Right. Right. Well, and I know, I I don't remember how long this study was, the one that I saw with the great polyphenols, but they did notice effects in interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha and LPS, it looks like. Those were some of the markers. Uh, But it it did seem to affect those areas in the study, but maybe it was a little longer or something. Mm. Uh, I, I I don't really know if they... I'd have to dig deeper into the the research. I'm going off of a slide. Yeah. Um, And I'm trying to skim really quickly because, I, like I said, I don't remember how long they gave the volunteers. Mm. Um, I'm not seeing it just skimming. But like I said, I think it was a little bit shorter duration of Mm -hmm. study if my memory serves me correctly. I don't – and I wouldn't expect to see a profound shift in in, – interleukin-6 for potentially days or weeks. So I don't know if they studied it long enough to really judge the interleukin-6 piece of it, but certainly LPS, you would think. uh, Right. For sure. Right. And then one more to kind of flesh out the conversation with the gut. Um, This is the one that honestly, the title says it all. It'll, it'll really be interesting. I think Uh, proanthocyanin containing polyphenol extracts from fruits prevent the inhibitory effect of hydrogen sulfide on human colonocyte mm. oxygen consumption. So Whoa. one of the reasons, <laughs> right? So one of the reasons why uh, hydrogen sulfide is no bueno, and one of the reasons why there's so much focus on it nowadays in the SIBO world is because the presence of hydrogen sulfide not only is a mit- mitochondrial poison, but it will also inhibit the colon cell's ability to utilize oxygen and having an oxygen gradient in the gut is very important for managing the ecosystem and managing the microbes. So not only are the colonocytes not gonna be utilizing their fuel and their oxygen sufficiently, but also you lose that oxygen gradient, which is going to make it much harder to correctly control your microbes and keep them at bay. So Mm -hmm. the fact that these polyphenol extracts inhibit hydrogen sulfide's ability to do that is crazy. Like it might, it may or may not lower the level of, of H2S. Like, I don't think they really looked at that, but the fact that you can mitigate some of the deleterious effects of H2S with polyphenols should be like the biggest light bulb right. mind blown moment for anybody who's struggling with SIBO or dysbiosis or inflammatory bowel disease. Is yeah. that that is huge. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I I hadn't heard that before, but it may I feel like again, typically with hydrogen sulfide, like I almost think Say it's it. like a low fiber, low plant food problem. And I, unfortunately, I just, I I really just think that a lot of the SIBO diets are driving hydrogen sulfide issues. Yes. It's it's so sad to watch, honestly. Yeah. Well, if you think like, I'll, I'll rattle off some of the foods in my list here that I pulled up. Um, If you think about Mm -hmm. how many of these foods are FODMAP containing foods and therefore get demonized the moment anybody gets diagnosed with SIBO. um, Let's see. Um, blueberries, FODMAP. Strawberries, no. Blackberries, I think. Yes, I think they're eat. FODMAP. Yeah, I think, I think with the berries, if you eat enough of them, any of the berries, like raspberries as well. Um, let's see, grapefruit juice. Grapefruit is a is a FODMAP. Um, and one of my favorite paintings behind me. I guess you can do grapes. Um, That's low FODMAP, right? Yeah, to an it extent. wasn't. It wasn't one of the higher foods though. Right. Um, right. Globe artichoke high FODMAP, um, cherries, plums, raspberries, apples, like a lot of these fruits that are polyphenol containing do have FODMAP content to them as well. So if you think like 
oftentimes when people go on a low FODMAP diet, I think that it can be potentially a slippery slope into a low polyphenol diet. And then mm-hmm. I don't know which is more detrimental. Like we talked about it in that hydrogen sulfide episode we did. I just had like a hair. Um, but we talked about it in the hydrogen sulfide episode, how a low FODMAP diet will actually make hydrogen sulfide overgrowth worse, right, if anything, right. according to the research. So it's the low FODMAP diet is contraindicated in folks who have hydrogen sulfide dysbiosis or SIBO. And if you think about it, this is the double whammy. Is it the, is it the FODMAPs or is it the polyphenols or is it both that are contributing to the effect that they saw in that study that looked at hydrogen sulfide dysbiosis right. and the low FODMAP diet? It probably both. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're, you're right on. I am. Um... I think too, like, have you ever in your practice used, because I've done it a a few times, like only if I feel like it's been really hard to incorporate foods Mm -hmm. or it's kind of going a little bit more slowly, but things like um, supplemental polyphenols, is that something Mm -hmm. that you use ever? A little bit. A little bit. Um... I'm kind of like, I'm a, I dabbled, um, because again, I think my overall goal is there's so many polyphenols in in the foods that you eat is yeah. to diversify. But like occasionally, I've done uh, some supplemental like grapeseed mm-hmm. extract. Yep, that's kind of higher in polyphenols. Um, I've done a couple other things before, but usually, again, I'm gonna be more pro trying to like work through some of the dietary issues. Yeah. But there's been a couple cases that I've experimented with supplemental polyphenols. Um, I think the overall goal, goal should be to diversify your own polyphenols in your diet. Yeah. But if there was a, there's like v- been very rare situations where I have used supplemental polyphenols. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I usually um, I, I have a similar approach to you typically, where I think the food is going to be more important. But yeah, like in like with folks who have been low FODMAP for potentially years and they're really scared to death to add in anything that could possibly maybe have a gram of FODMAP content to it, um, then we might do like a purified extract for a period of right. time before we add in the foods. Um, I usually like if, if I do use these polyphenols, it's usually great polyphenols as well. Um, yeah. But I, you know, maybe I could branch out and do some other ones with my patients. Um, funny enough, randomly. So when I, I was making a new handout for patients, which side note, I could put this, um, on my website. So there's a, I'll put a link if I remember, but it's just my URL, infinityholistichealth.com backslash social. You can get there from my Instagram Mm -hmm. too, but I'll put a download with this list for polyphenols. If you guys want this to like reference. Um, Mm -hmm. but when I was making this handout for my patients a couple weeks ago, um, it kind of inspired me and I'm always tinkering with stuff with my own health and my own gut. And I know with my history with antibiotic use, thank you, Lyme disease and your infections. Um, I kind of got curious. So I actually found myself a polyphenol supplement and I started taking it. I have not noticed oh. anything at all symptomatically. <laughs> Great. I don't have anything going on significantly. Right. So like, right. it's hard for me to say, but I don't know, like maybe I would get better sleep. I don't know. Um, so I've, I've just dabbled in it the teeny tiniest bit, but I just got that mm. like a week ago or maybe two weeks ago. Oh, cool. You'll have to keep yeah. us posted. Yeah. But with, with my patients, I'm usually using like a high polyphenol grape extract, if anything, if they're not yeah. able to do food. Right. Right. Yeah. That's, that's what I've, I've used in your, what's, I think it'd be interesting to me to know what are, what are your favorite polyphenols in your own life? Well, do you have any? Can I tell you my favorite foods or the actual names of the polyphenols? Because I don't know the names. No, of your all favorite. Polyphenols. Okay. Yes. No, that was mis. Okay. Misguided. Do you <laughs> tell this me was the like food, a really weird the high quiz. polyphenol rich foods that you enjoy? Okay, most. that's better. Um, because I was like, crap! I didn't know there was going to be a quiz in this podcast no, episode. I would have made flashcards no. or something for God's sake. Because <laughs> we would both fail the quiz, so okay. I wouldn't bring that up. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Um, yeah. So like, uh, I showed off one, I will show it off again. I have a thing of olives. Um, so funny enough, my husband would laugh if he ever listened to our podcast, which he does not. 
Um, I thought that I did not like olives until I met Michael Danessa. And then oh. when I went to meet his family for the first time at Easter, they had like an olive tray out. And I kind of just like felt the peer pressure of right. all of these Italian people looking at me. So oh I tried an olive and they're freaking delicious. They're fatty yeah, and good. salty. They are the perfect combination yeah. of salt and fat. All it needs is crunch. But yeah, so I have a jar of olives that I keep here. Uh, it's not opened yet, but I just got some at Trader Joe's to replenish my stock. Um, I am I really like strawberry, or I'm sorry, I well, I do like strawberries, but my two of my favorite fruits are raspberries and cherries. So those are, mm. are pretty good. I don't always get them. It depends if they're in season or if they're on sale yeah. or something. Um, chocolate. I can't leave out chocolate. I am a definite chocoholic. Um, Mm -hmm. so that's definitely top of the list. I did. You guys will be proud. I tried to drink coffee for about a month. I was so proud of myself after meet old Thomas told me I was bitter deficient. Yeah. Um, You're like, Oh no. (laughs) I decided, I was like, all right, I could try coffee as a grown up." And I got to a point where I was like, all right, I'm neutral on the taste now. Like, I don't love it. I don't hate it. I'm just kind of there. So I was getting polyphenols through coffee recently, but I was just kind of meh on the whole experience. So I discontinued my coffee stunt. Um, I do like tea. So tea is nice. Um, I actually really like grapefruits too. Again, I mm. think I have one behind me. Um, so yeah, grapefruits. I'm a nice. fan of. Any berries, I'm a big fan of. But yeah, that's probably yeah. the big list. We probably get the most strawberries just because our five-year-old is addicted to strawberries. Yeah, um, yeah. I I would probably go for like raspberries, cherries, grapefruit, if it was me, yeah. um, fruit-wise. But we kind of follow the whims of, of our little dictator <laughs> more often than not. Right. But how about you? Right. What are some of your favorite polyphenol foods? Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of raspberries. Like, I feel like of the berries, we're right on the same page there. Raspberries are probably my favorite. Chip loves raspberries. Good. I have to break them into, like, four pieces, and I'll, I'll throw them, whole sit and just watch me eat, and then I'll oh. throw them down. He's, he's a good eater. I'm, like, a fruit and vegetable eater, but I like cherries a lot, too. I like green tea. Mm-hmm. Is probably high up there. Yeah, I like the chocolate. You said you don't like bitter stuff, or that, but do you like tr- chocolate? Then chocolate can be I bitter. Do. Like, do you have a preference? I of bitterness, qual- like the percentage of cacao or whatever. It's hard to say if it's purely because I'm a crunchy hippy dippy health nut person. But over, th- so I grew up eating like Reese's peanut butter cups and Snickers right. bars. So I right. grew up eating normal sugar laden chocolate. And I think it was like when I became more health conscious, I didn't want to give up chocolate. So I just gradually increased the cacao percentage over time. Yes. Um, usually I'll get something in like the 75 or 80% range, but I have been yeah. known, like if somebody gets like an 88% dark, dark chocolate, I will eat that. And mm. Mike is gagging on it and won't eat it really and I'm like, oh yeah this is still good so i don't know if it's because i've like told myself oh it's a healthy chocolate this is good for me right or what it is right. but i do like chocolate even if it has almost no sh- sweetness to it so that is interesting Maybe yeah i'm not bitter deficient after all yeah that's what i'm wondering but i i like i like pretty dark chocolate at this point it's funny like whenever i think of like Hershey, like her traditional oh, Hershey style yeah. chocolate, you know. Well, we, my sister used to like love getting like the oversized, like you could buy huge Hershey, Hershey bars or like a big Hershey kiss. Yeah. And I swear, like if you go to our basement, we still have like, <laughs> like old Hershey bars that she bought that are, you know, oh like three feet long that she's just nibbled like the corner off. <laughs> Like you'll see all the teeth marks. She would do that with the big Hershey kisses too that you can That's buy like funny. from the store. It's just like you'll just see all these teeth marks, teeth marks that she's like nibbled off a corner or like the top of the Hershey kiss. It's so gross. At but like, why point, would what that becomes really difficult to eat? Because like you can nibble away at the parts that you can get your teeth on, but eventually you're right. left with like a sphere. And then right, I'm just picturing. <laughs> 
you guys are going to miss out if you're not watching the video, by the way. <laughs> but I'm picturing like, all right, here's the, no, olives. All right, here's the round orb surface of the Hershey Kiss. I'm picturing like, does yeah. she go? No, like, she goes from the top. Shave it? She goes from the, the crown, like the, the tippy top. She'd eat like from the top. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure I, I'm computing this. Um, like the Hershey Kiss, you know, it's like round at the bottom it, and then it makes a, it makes a point, you know? Yeah, but she I'm saying. She eats the point first. But if she eats the point, then. Yeah, you get to a point. Like quarters, I know what you're saying. You're going to run out of quarters to nibble on. And then what do you do? You either have to shave the chocolate off with your front teeth like a beaver. Well, I can tell you what she did. Or lick it. Or <laughs> she go after stopped. it with like a machete. <laughs> she reaches a point where I feel like she gets sick and is like, I don't want this anymore. And then, I don't know. I, it's absurd to me that they would sell things in that size. Because like, especially the Hershey bar. The Hershey bar is like this thick. Like, if and I'm yeah. making like an inch or two thick. And it's like long and it's like no one can eat like i don't know who could eat this um but yeah that was especially gross because it was like just not off like not off the corner <laughs> I... well i i will share this by the way so we are recording this uh shortly before father's day so it'll post sometime after father's day or early july i'm gonna tell not one but two chocolate-related stories having to do with my daddy-o, Steve Sear. Mm. And I'm going to rat him out at both of them, I think, just like paint a picture of my dad. So first of all, um, the oldest chocolate I've ever seen in my entire life, I think, was found in my dad's car because mm. he, he went to the store and he bought a Hershey bar for my mom for Mother's Day or birthday or something. I don't know. But he bought a Hershey bar as her kind of lame present for that year for whatever it was <laughs> it got lost in the bowels of his car and it went under the seat of his car where it lay dormant for god knows how long <laughs> and then someday in the distant future we were cleaning out his car lord knows why because his cars are always atrocious so i don't know why but for some reason we were cleaning out his car and i moved the seat up and i found this hershey bar and i got kind of excited because i was like yeah free chocolate and I opened it up and I kid you not, you know how chocolate will get like gray when it gets old enough? Yeah, like it'll get kind of like cracked and like, uh, yeah. Completely gray <laughs> with like a tinge of green almost to it. Like I don't oh, even God. know how long ago he had bought it, but I showed him and I was like, what the heck is this? And he, he still remembered, he was like, oh, that's the Hershey bar I got your mom for her birthday. <laughs> I was like, which birthday? And he was like, oh, it was a couple years ago. It's like, okay. Go oh ahead. my God. So yeah, so that was one story. The other thing. Well, well, I will say I'm glad that your dad got his dots connected. He did have some recollection of buying a Hershey bar. The Hershey bar went missing right. and then put two and two I'm together. sure he was just sitting around wondering where the heck that bar went. So yeah. yeah. I'm glad that dots were connected. Yes. He doesn't have to sit a, sit a, up at night thinking about where that he didn't. went. He didn't, but I'm sure yeah. <laughs> he was just like, oh, all right. <laughs> well, so then yeah, yeah. my second Father's Day chocolate related story. Now I will say, listener discretion is advised. The following okay. The following story could evoke a strong emotional reaction. It could evoke memories of childhood that you have buried deep in your psyche but I think it's still a worthwhile story. My dad fooled me for years of my life, years that I will never get back. The man, every time we stopped for gas, he would get a candy of some sort. Like, and yeah. I look back and I marvel at how far I've come, but we would feed the car gas and we would feed ourselves some junk food. And almost always he would go in the store, pay for the gas, and he would bring out a peanut butter cup. And he would be yeah. like, okay, you know, one for me, one for you. And we would enjoy our peanut butter cup. And then we would drive wherever we were driving. When I was like, I don't even know, but I think I was like seven years old. I found out that my dirty, rotten crook of a father was going into store, buying a four pack of peanut butter cups, <sighs> shoving two in his face immediately, and then bringing <laughs> out two. And he lied to me. He oh said my he gosh. was. He, 
I don't even know if he explicitly stated that he bought a two pack, but it was implied heavily. And he would bring oh out the God. two peanut butter cups and he'd be like, here, Nick, one for you, one for me. And then he would eat his third GD Reese's peanut butter cup. And I was none the wiser for many years. Oh I my feel gosh. so violated. I told that story to a friend recently. I don't remember why it came up. And my friend Paige was like, she was disgusted. She was like, I am appalled. You tell Mr. Sear that I thought more highly of him than that. I cannot believe he did that with peanut butter cups. She was so offended. So yes, my dirty rotten father tricked me for many years, giving me one measly peanut butter cup when I deserved two. So, oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. So those are my two Father's okay. Day related stories about chocolate. Excellent. And now I have to process that trauma all over again. <laughs> Uh, the only Father's Day story I can tell about my dad that involves chocolate is that my grandma every night would throw what she called a party when my dad was little, okay. which was Coke. This is right before bed. Okay. Coke, popcorn, and fudge that she would home like make homemade fudge. They would do this every night. My dad still says... He remembers, like, staring at a ceiling a lot when he was a kid. Like, being unable to fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's really sweet. Like, like, yeah, my grandma adorable. would call it the party. That's adorable, but also, hello, diabetes. Right. Well, yeah. It, oh, it, it, it It's crazy. But now, again, like, he always has to has, have dessert. Because of his parties, probably. Oh, gosh. From childhood. From childhood, but um, that's too yeah, much. fun stuff. That is too much. Well, my dear, I don't know where we could end on a higher note than telling chocolate-related stories about our dads shortly before Father's Day. So I think that's the perfect place to wrap. When you say, "Go, yes, go eat ma'am. some polyphenols, people. Polyphenols yes. out the wazoo. Your microbiome will thank you for it." Guys, as always, Mm -hmm. you know the drill by now, but I'm going to say it anyway. Like I said, if you want that link for the polyphenol food list, I will make sure that I put that on the link in my Instagram page. So go to Triangle Guts and you can download that with other goodies that I have available for download. Um, If you are listening to this on iTunes, please give us a five-star rating. We would love you forever and ever. If you are listening to this uh, and you feel compelled to share this message with the world, we would deeply appreciate it if you gave... A little, a little plug for the podcast in one of your IBS or SIBO groups or one of your other health-related groups online. Help us reach more people who need this information. And of course, if you are on YouTube, go ahead and like, click the bell, click the little, I don't even know, like comment. And we do collect comments and questions for our Q&A episodes that we do sporadically and when we feel like it. So you can email us at ibsfreedompod at gmail.com or you can put your comments down below in YouTube and we will mine for those on occasion and pull those out and then do q a's so thank you so much for all of that amy i will see you in the next pod yes